Welcome to the fourth AGN uh, tourney. Today we have uh, Francesca Panessa sharing uh, Roberto Maiolino and Michaela Hirschman. Um, the talks has been recorded. However, today, due to a technical problem, we have lost uh, the introduction of the two nights. So we will start just from the beginning of the first talk. Okay, so now let me start sharing. So, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, excellent, great. Um, okay, so first I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this AGN tournament. It's been really very exciting uh, during uh, the last days. And so now in my talk, I will focus on today's topic from a simulator's point of view. So I will try to give you a critical, also personal overview on the role of AGN feedback for quenching star formation in cosmological simulations and galaxy formation models, and actually also how these different models uh, actually work and some future perspectives. So let me start with showing you a schematic sketch taken from a recent paper, which I think nicely summarizes the different means of how star formation can be regulated or even quenched in a galaxy. So we have different possibilities. So first, gas may not be um, accreting or not cooling, so it's not entering the galaxy at first place via preventive mechanisms. Then gas, cold gas in the ISM may not be forming stars due to like heating or turbulence, or cold gas can be also very rapidly consumed. And then of course, gas can be also again removed from the central galaxy by um, ejective processes. And maybe you have noticed, HEN feedback can really contribute to all these different possibilities. So now let's focus on this um, specific uh, process. From observations, as we will hear in Roberto's talk, we have this, you know, increasingly large amount of evidence for um, gas heating and outflows. And so the corresponding, you know, um, energy source, so energy momentum can be injected into two main ways. So we have on the one hand, um, energy and radiation being released from a central black hole accretion disk where processes like photonization, Compton heating, or also radiation pressure can uh, heat the gas, potentially drive outflows, and potentially also reduce inflows. On the other hand, we have, you know, collimated jets of relativistic particles um, originating from magnetohydrodynamic processes in, in the vicinity of a spinning black hole, um, typically found in local radio galaxies, and so often associated with black holes accreting at fairly low rates. Now, if we would want to really fully understand how these um, processes, mechanisms, affect the ISM and the star formation in a simulation, in principle, we would need to resolve subparsic scales, um, follow radiative transfer, and, and resolve a structured ISM. But you know, this is largely feasible to do in a full cosmological, unfeasible to do in a, in a cosmological context. So instead, to still get an idea of how HEN feedback may affect the evolution of a galaxy, different um, empirical separate sub-resolution models have been developed to basically smooth over the small scale complexity. They were assumed initially in galaxy formation models, but now more recently, thanks to increased computational power, significant progress has been achieved by performing these large scale hydro simulations, also adopting such separate models as well as high resolution zoom in simulations focusing on individual objects, but still in a full cosmological context. And so now let me jump directly into showing you a visualization of one of our cosmological zoom in simulations of a massive um, galaxy. So uh, in that simulation, we basically model HEN feedback via recipes for nuclear accretion disk winds motivated by observed broad absorption line winds. And we also have recipes for photonization, Compton heating, and radiation pressure due to X-ray radiation. And now here you will be seeing the evolution of the gas content color coded by temperature for two runs, one with and one without HEN feedback. And the white circle here illustrates the halo very radius. And so initially at redshift three, you can still see a lot of gas 
um, moving, falling towards the center of the galaxy. And then as soon as the central black hole becomes active, it drives these huge outflows into the circumgalactic and partly even intergalactic medium. And when we were analyzing, quantifying these gas outflows, um, we actually found they are roughly, you know, consistent with um, observational uh, findings uh, summarized in a recent study of Fiore et al., even though we can, of course, not really resolve molecular or ionized outflows directly, okay? Now, interestingly, we found also that our EGN feedback model is not only working, you know, in an ejective mode, but it simultaneously strongly suppresses late in, um, accretion, re-accretion of previously ejected gas back onto the galaxy. So these inflow rates can be reduced by more than one order of magnitude, meaning our AGN feedback model is simultaneously working in a preventive mode. Okay, And we find these mechanisms to be crucial in our simulation to actually um, transform such a star-forming massive disk-like galaxy into a more realistic, pure elliptical-like galaxy, mostly composed of old stellar populations. And in general, when we are looking into literature over the past decade or so, I think a coherent picture has been emerging from both cosmological simulations and models in the sense that HEN feedback is really necessary to overcome a number of problems when you want to simulate galaxies, in particular massive galaxies, not only with respect to getting uh, reasonable morphologies, but also to contribute to the strong size evolution observed for massive galaxies, lowering the cold gas fractions, and in particular, sufficiently suppress quench star formation in these massive systems such that a red sequence can actually emerge. And now in this panel here, you can explicitly see star formation rate histories for our simulated dated uh, galaxies, where star formation rates at late times can be reduced by several orders of magnitude, okay? Which then results in significantly reduced stellar content, so stellar baryon conversion efficiency for a given um, halo mass, more consistent with abundance matching predictions, what is shown here by the different lines. And a further direct consequence of this is that also the massive end of the galaxy stellar mass function is uh, affected, is lowered, also in better agreement with observations. So certainly there may also be, you know, uh, a contribution to star formation quenching from other processes discussed in literature like gravitational heating, shock heating, morphological quenching, or potentially gas heating due to magnetic field pressure. But it, I have the impression when really looking at, you know, high resolution cosmological zoom in simulations, that these processes alone are not sufficient to quench star formation in massive systems, in particular, keep them quiescent. Okay. The situation instead changes when we turn towards lower mass galaxies. So here, simulations and models tend to agree that star formation is more strongly governed by stellar feedback and environmental processes. So environmental processes can quench star formation in lower mass satellites. Stellar feedback is not really quenching star formation. It's more like, you know, delaying, uh, suppressing star formation at early times, but delaying it towards later times. And the reason why HEN feedback likely plays a res less strong role for these lower mass systems is that stellar feedback probably strongly, you know, affects, regulates the gas content in the vicinity of the black hole, so preventing strong accretion events, therefore preventing strong feedback events. Now, in addition to shaping these galaxy properties, HEN feedback has been also repeatedly shown to regulate the important flow for black hole growth itself and leading to more realistic HEN populations, for example, in terms of uh, reproducing the essence or capturing the essence of the observed so-called anti rapid trend in black hole growth. So with that, I basically mean the observational finding that luminous HEN, um, the number density of luminous HEN peaks at higher redshift than that of less luminous HEN. Here you can see in this plot an explicit comparison between the observational compilation of Hopkins et al. and predictions from our magneticum simulation. And so I think that HEN feedback is really here crucial to, to um, yeah, regulate the gas density in the result vicinity of the black hole such that it's decreasing towards later times and towards higher black hole masses. 
okay? such that towards lower redshifts, massive black holes start to accrete way below the peak luminosities, meaning way below their maximum Eddington rates, what therefore results in the strong decline of luminous HEN towards, towards uh, lower redshifts. So the bottom line from the last few slides is basically that I think the vast majority of simulations and models agrees that to get realistic populations of galaxies and HEN, an additional energy source, that SHEN feedback is necessary. But now despite this success, and I would say also great progress uh, recently in getting you know, these amazing large-scale cosmological simulations, we still should keep in mind that this is based on a large variety of different models adopted for black hole seeding growth and feedback which simply emerged or developed due to our poor knowledge of how these small scale physical processes actually work in reality. And so here I've listed some of these models. This list is by no means complete. So it's just models which were adopted in simulations in literature. I also don't have the time to go into detail, but the point I want to make is that simulations having these different models, they are more or less able to produce realistic galaxies, but this may happen for very different reasons, okay? And partly maybe just being related to tuning some of the free parameters. What therefore, in my opinion, clearly limits to some extent the predictive power of these also modern cosmological simulations. For example, we cannot really answer or, or know what's the, the main physical origin causing this gas heating outflows and so on, whether this is mostly due to, you know, radiation pressure from the black hole accretion disk, or is it mostly due to Compton photonization heating? So we cannot answer this because these processes are unresolved. And in the same spirit, I think it's also hard to robustly answer whether star formation quenching in cosmological simulations is mostly happening via accretion disk or jet mode feedback. I think to some extent it depends on the numerical implementation. Sometimes there's not really a distinction at all. Also more recently, like looking at the illustrious TNC or Simba simulation, there seems to be a, a, well, an agreement emerging that at least for quenching star formation in massive galaxies at late times, it's mostly happening via kinetic jet mode feedback. What you can see here when you look at the blue curve uh, in, in this plot showing basically the, the energy rate for kinetic HEN feedback versus redshift for massive galaxies in the TNG simulation. Now, in addition to that, you can further ask, can we at least learn something accurate about whether HEN star formation quenching is mostly proceeding in an ejective, preventive, or um, way or mostly via ISM heating. And also here, I think it's it's hard to answer this question from a simulation point of view. Maybe it's even an ill-posed question, because as I said a few slides before, in our simulations, we find that it's really likely a combination of all of these different processes, okay? And I think this has also been found in a, in a recent study uh, investigating that in the illustrious TNG simulation. So overall, Again, even if you, if a simulation predicts realistic galaxies, this may happen for wrong reasons, so that whether simulated galactic scale gas heating outflows or reduced inflows are fully realistic is, I think, still to some extent unclear. And I think this uncertainty, it becomes particularly evident when we want to understand HEN feedback and regimes where we have maybe less observational constraints available. So for example, to what extent HEN feedback is actually responsible for uh, causing quiescence in high redshift massive galaxies, or what's the role of HEN feedback for regulating star formation in dwarfs, where it seems like there's an increasing tension emerging between simulations and uh, observations. But so now I've been talking, you know, a lot about limitations and, and open problems, but how can we now move on? So how, how can we improve the situations? And so I see two main ways of how to do that. So on the one hand, I think it's really important more to uh, perform and focus on detailed feedback simulations where we can really try and capture explicitly the underlying physical 
uh, processes, like how release energy momentum actually couples to the ISM. There has been achieved, I think, also great progress over the past years, for example, by performing detailed radio chat simulations, which indeed, at some, to some extent, uh, indicate some interaction of the released energy with the ISM in terms of gas heating and outflow. So not just drilling through the ISM and affecting like the intra-group or intra-cluster medium. In addition, as another example, there have been performed interesting radiation hydro simulations of isolated galaxies, where they found that, uh, you know, radiation from a, a black hole accretion disk may indeed be capable of driving outflows. And in particular, radiation pressure on dust grains may also be a very uh, promising or important process. Of course, these idealized simulations, they also do have their own limitations. Unfortunately, we cannot yet combine them with a full cosmological context. Nevertheless, I think we should use them more as a guidance when designing our subgrid models, but of course should go hand in hand with increasing resolution in our uh, cosmological simulations. In this way, trying to bridge the gap between small and large scales. But this is actually uh, not straightforward to do. It's, it's very uh, complicated. And so therefore, simultaneously, I think it's equally important to take advantage of new modern, in particular, spatially resolved observational constraints. And this way, trying to break the degeneracies between these, at first sight, different successful HEN feedback models, which are out there uh, in literature. In this way, getting an improved understanding of how um, HEN feedback is actually quenching star formation in, in galaxies, OK? And I think a very enlightening example uh, we can have uh, when looking at the connection between the cold mass, stellar mass, specific star formation rate, what has been shown in a recent study uh, by Terrazzo et al. So they plot these different quantities against each other for star forming and quiescent T and G galaxies shown by the blue and the red uh, contours and also for observed local galaxies shown by the uh, star forming and quiescent galaxies shown by the black and uh, gray symbols. And so even if you know TNG roughly reproduces the observed trends, you can still see uh, significant differences. For example, the scatter in the black hole stellar mass relation is much smaller. And also the transition to quiescence seems to be way too abrupt in TNG. So in other words, there seems to be missing a population of star forming massive galaxies with comparably low black hole masses. And now this may point towards some, some shortcomings in the way they're seeding their black holes, but it may also point towards like some necessary modifications of how HEN feedback is modeled, which may quench star formation too abruptly above a given mass cut due to their assumptions. And I think that's a good test for other simulations and, and models. Um, but there are also, I think, other interesting observations to consider, such as gas metallicity in and around galaxies. So in the past, there has been, for example, used hot gas uh, fractions, iron abundances in group and cluster halos, which were very you know, constraining, for example, ruling out just a thermal energy input for modeling uh, HEN feedback. And then when turning to the ISM, I think it's also important to, you know, consider each alpha maps. So reflecting the underlying distribution of star formation rates, um, also distribution of gas metallicities, which should have imprinted the way HEN feedback is actually working. And so now for the last few minutes, um, just let me show you a few preliminary results of our zoom-in simulations. So here you can see for two example galaxies. Um, you have two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you can see the distribution of star formation uh, rates with and without HEN feedback. You can see clearly the impact of this process in causing these like ring-like uh, star formation rate structures are also strongly reducing the spatial extent of the star forming region. So we have signs for both inside out and outside in quenching, which I think is to some extent reflecting also the observed diversity, but for having an accurate comparison, I think we would really need to directly look at H alpha maps. And I'll come to that in a minute. 
So I just want to also mention that with the student, we started now to also look into uh, metallicity gradients of massive galaxies, which we found to be affected by AGN feedback below a redshift of one-ish due to, again, strongly reduced central in situ star formation and the um, suppression of, of accretion of metal per gas. These flatter gradients tend to be more consistent with observed ones in massive galaxies like in Manga and Khalifa. But if you have a closer look to the observations, then they actually uh, find a very large scatter, both low, high, but also low redshifts for a given stellar mass, also finding positive gradients. And now you may wonder, is this a modeling limitation or does it maybe come from, you know, um, uncertainty is the way observers derive these metal gradients, mostly from strong line ratios. And so therefore, the very last main point I want to make in this talk is that I think we really should compare apples to apples. So to really obtain robust observational constraints on uncertain models in simulations like AGN feedback. So for that, we need to establish an accurate interface between simulations and observations. And um, so to, for example, why a synthetic spectra not only having the, you know, um, stellar continuum, but also having emission lines. They have been made past attempts, and I just want to mention a methodology we have been developing, so modeling nebula emission lines of simulated galaxies originating from, originating from ionized regions around various ionizing sources. And with such an interface, we could then look at patterns directly for HEN feedback and H alpha maps. We can derive metal gradients in the same way as, or similar way as observers do. And so since I'm fully running out of time, I just want to leave you here with my summary and just um, uh, uh, saying a last sentence that I'm, I think, very excited about future um, observational missions, for example, with the James Webb Telescope, which will hopefully provide us with um, a large number of, of observational data on high redshift galaxies and so hopefully putting strong constraints on how HEN feedback proceeds and regulates star formation in high redshift galaxies out of the epoch of reionization. Okay, so I'll stop here and I thank you. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Itaela, for this clear presentation. Now it's time for Roberto. Roberto, can you hear me? Yes. I cannot hear you, Roberto. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, also now? Yes. Right, so uh, thank you uh, again uh, to the organizer for inviting me to give this uh, short presentation. I was asked to give the, the observational equivalent of Michaela's uh, presentation. And uh, when they invited me, the organizer uh, uh, told me that it shouldn't be really a review, but uh, more uh, actually my bold uh, perspective. So uh, I'll try to be as bold uh, as, uh, as I can in this presentation. Okay, so the, the problem, uh, as Michael has already explained, is to understand uh, in galaxy quenching, uh, what quenches star formation in galaxies and how it is, how uh, galaxies move, uh, what is responsible for uh, shifting galaxies from the star forming main sequence to the quiescent uh, population. And uh, um, in, in this cartoon, I have summarized uh, in a simplified way uh, all the possible uh, causes of uh, uh, quenching, environment, star formation, black hole accretion, and mass. Uh, and uh, uh, for each of these, uh, the various possible mechanisms that, through which uh, these uh, various causes can quench star formation, for instance, uh, removing gas, and therefore you uh, remove the fuel from star formation or if you leave the gas in uh, uh, suppressing the efficiency with which this gas can form stars, or preventing further uh, accretion of fresh gas, in which case uh, the available gas is being consumed by uh, ongoing star formation, and once that's completely 
consumed, the galaxy dies essentially by starvation. This is what uh, is called often as uh, preventive or uh, delayed feedback. And of course, all of these mechanisms are at work, and in different galaxies, uh, different mechanisms can uh, have a different role, okay? An example of this diversity of quenching is given by this uh, famous uh, plot uh, where you have the standard halo mass ratio as a function of halo mass, and the uh, common idea is that at high masses, uh, AGN and quasars uh, are uh, the, the dominant, have a dominant role, while at low masses, star formation have uh, feedback is, uh, is more important. Well, my bold statement will be that this uh, plot is, is wrong in terms of quenching. I can already hear uh, people, uh, despite the microphone uh, being muted, uh, screaming in, in outrage, but I'll try to motivate this bold uh, statement. So uh, I will try essentially to show that, uh, at least for central galaxies and uh, high mass uh, satellites, black hole is the, uh, uh, the main uh, responsible for quenching. Okay, and uh, I'll show how this is uh, um, uh, motivated. So this, uh, here in Cambridge, Asa Black has investigated the special resolved quenching of, uh, of galaxies, that is by using the Manga survey. So it's about uh, 10,000 galaxies with intra spectroscopy. And when you investigate the uh, special resolved quantities, that is the surface density of the star formation rate, the surface density of stellar mass, you end up with equivalent, uh, the uh, specially resolved equivalent of the main sequence, that is uh, star forming regions uh, uh, essentially line along um, this uh, well-defined uh, relationship. And regions which are quenched uh, essentially uh, are well below this, uh, this relationship. And you have uh, galaxies which are on main sequence uh, fully star forming and uh, uh, or galaxies which are fully quenched and you can also have galaxies which are in, in the midway, that is, uh, have uh, some outer regions, star forming inner regions uh, quenched, uh, and vice versa. Okay. Now, you can at this point, uh, so this is a step further with respect to the classical classification of fully star forming and fully quenched. This, uh, you can actually explore a much uh, more in detail the diversity of galaxies. And when you do, do, you do so, you can actually investigate how the quenching of the various uh, regions of the galaxy depends on the various galaxy parameters. And uh, stellar mass, uh, velocity dispersion, um, environment, and so on. And when you do uh, this kind of investigation, you find that what the has found is that by far the most important parameter is uh, the black hole mass, as given by the central velocity dispersion. And this, uh, you can see this here, where the, the, the same distribution that we saw in the previous plot is color coded now by black hole mass. And I've never seen, honestly, such a sharp difference in terms of. Uh, uh, galaxy parameters which can, can actually co which uh, correlates with the galaxy quenching. This is one of the neatest, uh, most statistically sound effect that I've ever seen in terms of uh, galaxy quenching. Uh, now you may say, okay, but black hole mass correlates with a lot of other things, so how can you be sure that it's not some induced effect from a, another parameter? Well, you can t test it, you can disentangle the various effects. For instance, here you have the black hole mass as a function of uh, stellar mass, uh, and the distribution now is color coded by fraction of quenched galaxies. And you see that for the uh, stellar, inner stellar mass, uh, the uh, quenched fraction is strong function of black hole mass, while for the given black hole mass, the quench, the quench fraction is essentially very little dependent on stellar mass. The same applies for the halo mass. Essentially, the halo mass doesn't have nearly any effect on the fraction of quenched galaxies. And you can investigate these uh, kind of uh, dependencies with all galaxy parameters. Of course, you need a more sophisticated uh, statistical analysis, and uh, that's what we have done by running, a, a virus, uh, in this case, a, a sort of a machine learning technique, and you can use all kind of statistical analysis or machine learning analysis that you want, and all of them, you have tried to give the same result. So you have here the relative importance of various galactic parameters, both global, such as stellar mass, bulge mass, and so on, local, local surface density, for instance, uh, and environmental, for instance, uh, halo mass, uh, uh, overdensity of galaxies, and so on. 
And as you see, the, by far the, the most important parameters regulating, predicting the uh, probability that uh, a galaxy or a region in a galaxy is quenched is the black hole mass, okay? And this is uh, um, true essentially for all central galaxies and high mass satellites. This is not, uh, doesn't apply for low mass uh, satellites, which uh, you have a similar plot for satellites, in which case, of course, environment becomes much more important. So my bold statement is that uh, the ruler uh, of quenching is actually black hole, at least for central and high mass satellites. So black hole is the, the king or the queen, I don't know what is the gender of black holes, but in, in this context, I think king or queen is a given that we're talking about medieval tournaments. Um, now, so I will get rid of all the rest and focus on black holes. Now it's the matter of investigating how does black hole uh, quench the galaxy, either gas, through gas removal, uh, suppressing suffocation efficiency, or through starvation. Let's look at first uh, at uh, the ejective mode. We know that uh, uh, AGNs are uh, very effective in driving outflows, and we know that these outflows are multi-phase, multi-scale, and multi-evoc. And uh, I mean, I, beyond is beyond the scope of this, uh, this uh, talk to give an, an extensive review of the various properties of outflows. I just uh, show a few examples to indicate this uh, multi-property of outflows. This is, for instance, a very uh, is a, a really fantastic result of recently obtained by Stephen Carnell, where we investigated the uh, molecular outflows in the inner regions of uh, a local of the outflow of the nearby C for Galaxy and C for 945. Where you actually resolve the individual clouds, clouds with the sizes as small as a few parsecs outflowing, and uh, uh, some of these uh, um, self gravitating, which is has uh, I mean this uh, individual. Um, uh, plot uh, actually the, the, the figure would deserve a separate an entire separate uh, talk and as you go to higher ratio in this case you are probing an ionized outflow you actually even with adaptive optics you, you probe scales on uh, uh, which are uh, much larger in kiloparsec scales and even at a big of, of uh, realization uh, you can probe outflows in this case for instance using the c2 line this is the work by college Gone where you actually uh, probe outflows on scales of uh, tens of kiloparsecs, in this case, in the atomic fields. Now, I don't want to uh, investigate further uh, these uh, the properties, but just to mention that the idea of having uh, the, the main uh, mechanism for uh, generating these uh, large scale outflows is uh, as uh, realized primarily in those two kinds of driving mechanisms, which are in implicitly actually embedded also in numerical simulation. That is, one is the momentum driven and the other is the energy driven uh, modes. So the idea is that the, um, the main uh, driving engine is a very fast outflow at the base of the, very close to the AGN, which is probed by the, uh, through, often through X-ray spectroscopy. And then these uh, very fast winds uh, uh, shocks the circumnuclear uh, medium and depending on whether the, the shock gas cools very quickly through radiation, so uh, dissipate energy very quickly, uh, uh, in which case uh, uh, the uh, lose uh, essentially stops very quickly and transfer mostly momentum to the uh, to the circumnuclear um, interstellar medium. In the, in the other case, uh, what you have is that uh, if instead the uh, the shock the shock gas uh, is uh, much less effective in uh, cooling and uh, doesn't radiate the energy, then it expands in a sort of adiabatic uh, blast wave and can invest the ISM on much larger, uh, develop and uh, invest the ISM on much larger scales, and in each case can be much more, sorry, much more um, effective in, in uh, uh, the outflow. And people, of course, have been investigating whether it, we are in one regime or the other through various observations. It's not simple to discriminate. This is a, a recent uh, compilation obtained by Marasco where they investigated the momentum rate of the outflow relative to the momentum rate of the large scale outflow relative to the momentum rate of the nuclear uh, youth, uh, fast um, nearly relativistic outflow. And you see that in many cases, uh, the outflow is, uh, the large scale outflow is more consistent with momentum driven. Although there are quite a, a new few cases where the, um, the momentum, the boost in momentum rate that you see is consistent with the energy driven. Although 
is, is uh, more often the case I've seen that uh, is consistent with domain retrieval. But however, even if the, uh, the outflow is being pushed by the uh, on large scales by the, the agent driven outflows, the issue is that uh, most of this gas doesn't really escape uh, the galaxy. Most of it, uh, uh, only a small fraction, leave the galaxy. And if you investigate uh, how much uh, of this gas actually escape their halo, this fraction is even less. So most of the gas ejected by the outflow will rain back onto the galaxy to fuel additional star formation. The, uh, so it doesn't seem the ejected mode uh, to be very effective. And even in very uh, uh, powerful quasar at high redshift, what we see is that the uh, quasar-driven outflow, traced in this case by the O3 line, actually is capable of suppressing star formation, as traced by Chalfa, as Michaela was mentioning, but is affecting only uh, star formation locally. The rest of the galaxy remains seem to remain uh, relatively unaffected. So uh, uh, the ejective mode may play a role, but it doesn't seem to be so effective. Uh, what about starvation? Uh, this, uh, so the four, the so-called preventive or delayed feedback, where you hit the halo and you prevent gas from uh, accreting, uh, cold gas from accreting onto the galaxy. Well, um, these uh, can be contributed by the, by the outflows again. And uh, uh, the reason why the outflows, uh, the agent driven outflows are not so effective is probably because the coupling with the SM is relatively uh, mild in the sense that most of the energy injected into the, uh, into the SM actually escapes along the direction of, of least resistance and so it goes into heating uh, the hail and therefore this prevents cold attrition and therefore you have afterwards a delayed feedback by starvation. Now, the uh, finding observational evidence of this uh, uh, halo heating uh, is very difficult uh, directly. You would uh, need uh, essentially the X-ray is Athena. You would have to wait uh, 10 years. But you can uh, start investigating this through this Nervous effect. And people have tried to do this by trying to stack uh, CMB uh, experiment data, experimental data on the line of sight of uh, thousands of quasars. And if you do this stacking, you start to see the signature of the LZ effect associated with the halo, hot halo associated with this quasar. Of course, uh, you would like to see this synergy uh, uh, effect associated with the hot halo uh, directly in individual quasars. And this starts to be feasible with ALBA, which is in D-Rich. And in this, there are a few um, individual detections of uh, uh, LZ with, with ALBA at uh, a few sigma. But uh, uh, this is a simulation with, uh, of a student of mine who has shown that actually with the proper strategy, you can clearly detect this uh, signal with ALMA with, uh, with, uh, if you uh, adopt the proper strategy. So in the future, we, as, we uh, probably expect many more of these detections. Um, the other mechanism with which uh, the, the halo can be heated, as we know, uh, for, uh, this has been known for a long time, is through radio jets. And uh, it's been known uh, very, uh, for a long time that uh, the, the, the energy injected into the halo by the radio jets and the, the bubbles essentially is uh, uh, near, very uh, close to the uh, cooling uh, power of certain dex rays, which means that uh, indeed the radio jets are very effective in heating the halo. My main objection to this mechanism has always been that um, radio jets are very directional, not, are not uh, isotropic. And therefore, it wasn't clear to me how they can heat the entire halo with this mechanism. But uh, essentially, God could be, I was convinced by this mechanism when I saw these fantastic uh, maps, which is obtained, uh, this in this case is the Perseus cluster, where you have run on the X-ray image a, an edge detection uh, algorithm, where you actually uh, reveal all of these uh, waves, which are essentially sound waves, which indicates that the energy injected by the uh, radio jets and by this uh, radio bubbles is propagated throughout the halos through these uh, sound waves. So in the end, you have essentially an isotropic heating of, of the halo. Um, in in uh, an indication that this uh, uh, radio jet preventing the maintenance feedback is very effective is given by the fact that uh, all galaxies with in which these all agents in which you have this radio mode agent uh, in place are systematically below the uh, subforming sequence. 
uh, on the other hand, the galaxies agents which uh, do not these have uh, which do not have this little mode uh, on, and therefore are yeah, affecting the the ISA primarily through these uh, more mild, uh, more instantaneous uh, outflows. Actually, are closer to the main sequence, which again is an indication that the ejective mode is not so effective in directly quenching the star formation in galaxies. Uh, just to note that uh, the radio mode has always been indicated as something happening locally. It's more in the form of maintenance mode, where you have already cleaned the galaxy and you keep the galaxy clean by preventing further accretion from the halo. But actually, if you see that uh, that um, how this evolved. You see that uh, in, uh, heated cavities are already seen at a relatively high redshift, and therefore, this radio mode actually has been important already uh, in, the, in the peak of uh, star formation epochs, and therefore, can uh, is probably not only a maintenance effect, but actually could be a mechanism which actually has initiated uh, heating at high redshift, and therefore has initiated starvation already at high redshift. Uh, just to note that uh, the fact that galaxies, uh, the starvation is, a, is an important mechanism for uh, quenching galaxies, is can be inferred by the stellar metallicity of galaxies. Indeed, when uh, in, in the case that you starve uh, a galaxy, during the starvation phase, the, ga the gas becomes very metal rich, and so the new stars form out of the, the, the gas in this closed box uh, mode when the galaxy is starving have much higher metallicities, and therefore you obtain a passive galaxy which is much more metal rich than the star forming progenitors, and this is what is actually seen in observation. So this is confirmation that this starvation preventive mode or delayed uh, feedback is very important in, in the quenching of galaxies. What about star formation efficiency uh, suppression? Uh, this has uh, often been neglected in the most studies, both in observation and theories, but in the last few years, it has become clear that actually is actually a, a mechanism, a, 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 a process, an effect which is as important as the gas content. So this is, uh, for instance, she is seen in this study by uh, our student uh, Aja Petroska, but it's essentially the same result has been found by all other studies investigated the, the same kind of uh, process. So uh, here you have the gas fraction and star formation efficiency as a function of uh, distance from the main sequence. So quenched galaxies are on the left here. And you see that uh, in terms of gas fraction for it in beams of stellar mass, what you have is that as you go, you leave the galaxy leave the main sequence, you have a lower gas fraction. And this is uh, already uh, known, and we have seen that the DGN can help with that. However, at the same time, you see that the star formation efficiency, which is the star formation per unit gas mass also drops significantly as you leave the main sequence. And you see this uh, more clearly here, where you have the star formation efficiency as a function of gas fraction, where points are, this is again from manga, points are color coded uh, in terms of uh, uh, distance from the main sequence. So orange is on the main sequence, and as you go towards the darker uh, regions, you are uh, in the quench region. And you see it has uh, galaxies or star forming regions quench, they actually decrease both the gas mass, the gas content, the gas fraction, but also the star formation efficiency. They go hand to hand, okay? And this is not seen, uh, this is seen for all galaxies locally, all population of galaxies locally, and also at high redshift. This is a similar study by Takoni and Genzel. Here you see that, again, you have the distance from the main sequence, as you leave the, uh, the, the main sequence, the gas fraction reduces, it gets lower, and uh, the, in this case you have the depletion time scales, which is the inverse of the star formation efficiency, and you have that the depletion time scales increases, which means that the star formation efficiency decreases, exactly as you see in the local universe. So you have, we have seen that the gas, the, the uh, AGN and quasar activity can help in reduce the gas fraction, therefore quenching uh, star formation through uh, removal of, or, uh, of gas or through starvation, can uh, they can also account for these uh, changes in star formation efficiency? Maybe yes. This is a very nice result by... Uh, Professor, uh, you have two minutes. Yes, by Giacomo Venturi, 
where um, using the news, uh, we have explored a number of few uh, nearby silver galaxies. A few of them have radio jet. And uh, you see that the oxygen tree map uh, follows the radio jet in this case, and essentially is a sort of ionization cone in this direction. But when you investigate the velocity dispersion, actually, the velocity dispersion increases uh, dramatically perpendicular to the jet in the ISM of the galaxy. And this is exactly what is expected by uh, simulations of uh, jets. Essentially, what happens is that as the jet finds its way out of the galaxy, it also injects energy in the ISM, and this increases the turbulence and the heating of the, of the ISM. So by increasing the, the velocity dispersion, of course, you inc increase the uh, tumor, the, the stability parameters, so you stabilize the gas and therefore it prevents it from forming stars, and the heating also, of course, also helps. Of course, there have been also in, in detailed individual uh, studies which have investigated more specifically what is the submission efficiency in low, um, uh, low luminosity genes with uh, weak radio jets. And it has been found that indeed uh, these galaxies with uh, weak agents and uh, radio jets do have a lower star formation efficiency with respect to the Schmidt Kentuck law than uh, normal galaxies. Okay, so agents. Uh, and the re weak radio jet seems to help in reducing the self formation efficiency that we see in all uh, galaxies which leave the main sequence and go into the quiescent regions. However, when you look at quasars and uh, luminous agents, especially at higher shift, the puzzling result is that these behave orthogonally to it. And this is shown in this uh, result uh, recently published by Manuel Biscetti, but is, uh, the same result is obtained by uh, various other studies. And what you see here is that the is this gas fraction is a function of stellar mass, and these shaded regions is the, uh, the, uh, the distribution of main sequence galaxies. You see that the gas mass in uh, the gas fraction in uh, quasar host uh, galaxies is lower than in the main sequence, and this is in line with what we see with the large population of galaxies. But when you look at the star formation efficiency, this is actually much higher than uh, main sequence galaxies. So these, from this point of view, in terms of star formation efficiency, quasar host galaxy behaves totally differently from all other population of galaxies, both locally and at high redshift and over masses. And this is a really puzzling result. Uh, interesting, but also puzzling. It's not clear why it's that, and this is, has to be investigated further. I, I think that GWST will help certainly for this. One possibility is that uh, in the way of quenching the galaxy, the quasar through the uh, pressure induced in the SM and in the outflow, it also uh, introduced a short uh, period of positive feedback where the star formation is actually boosted. But uh, this is uh, essentially still not clear, even because most of these studies are totally, uh, mostly uh, unresolved, uh, at least on uh, the interesting scales. So uh, summarizing, uh, my main point, uh, my take home points are that the black hole is the dominant uh, actor in determining whether a galaxy is uh, uh, quenched or not, at least for uh, central galaxies and uh, high mass satellites. In terms of how it does it, the ejective mode can help in uh, shutting down locally, centrally, the star formation and removing gas, but doesn't seem to be uh, very effective across the entire galaxy. The preventive mode in terms of he, uh, the uh, AGN hitting the halo, uh, either through um, outflows or uh, through radio jets, uh, seem and therefore suppressing uh, cold gas inflows and therefore uh, resulting into the galaxy starving, uh, and therefore delayed and preventive thing. But this seems to be a mode which is probably the most promising for uh, quenching uh, the, the host galaxies of uh, AGNs, or uh, for black holes more generally. In terms of uh, star formation efficiency, this is a new phenomenon that uh, has, been, has been identified only in the last few years. The radio jet seems to be um, effective and low luminous agents in uh, reducing the, uh, the, the star formation efficiency through injection of uh, turbulence and heating in the SM. Uh, the, uh, the only uh, population which behaves uh, in, in a weird uh, way in this respect are powerful quasars and luminous agents, which seems to behave totally differently by possibly 
it, it maybe temporarily induced some positive feedback in on the way to to question. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, I think we could start our session of questions. So if you would like to uh, ask a question to my, Michaela or Roberto, please sign in on the chat and I will call you to, to... yes, Bozena, go ahead. Okay, I can start. Uh, first of all, uh, in Polish language, uh, a black hole is definitely a female. Just our language tells that. So it is a queen and not a king, definitely. <laughs> but a serious question. I'm not working in the field, so I, 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 I'm not sure I, I, I got this uh, correctly, but I had an impression that in general, this jet like interaction is more like long distance and better uh, handling the, the, the quench of, of star formation. Uh, on the other hand, statistically, we have 10% of quasars which are radio load and 90% which are not radio load. So, in the need of quenching in every quasar would perhaps imply that in every quasar you uh, go through this jet like stage, which takes only 10% of time, and then you have 90% of time when it's radio quiet. But in all quasars, you have the, the right effect of quenching. Is it stupid? Yeah, no, no. Okay. I don't know if this is a question for me or Michaela, but my pers personal perspective is that, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe even because now we know that the, this jet mode is also important at, uh, at higher high shift. Uh, my my opinion is that uh, the mode is certainly effective, but uh, I think also the simply heating through uh, agent even winds. Uh, I mean, uh, not calling, I mean, uh, wide scales and wide angle. Uh, um, outflows can be very effective in hitting the hill because uh, they are very energetic and in the end most of this energy goes into the hill not into the ism and so uh, that's why i was saying that uh, um, I i'm expecting it that uh, uh, most uh, uh, luminous quasars are uh, hosted in a, in a hot halo which is heated by their own winds and this seems to be confirmed by this uh, early observation of the sunrise and object effect I don't know if uh, uh, Michaela wants to add anything from the uh, simulation perspective. Yeah, so I, I think from from the simulation perspective, it's it's I mean it's hard again because in a way we cannot really distinguish whether you know the the heating of the halo is due to a jet or due to caused by by winds because. We are modeling it in the same way. It's just that you give some momentum injection. And then, of course, we do see when you do that, then you heat the halo. And that is an important process. Also, it seems to be mostly important towards lower redshifts. But again, it strongly depends on the way you model it. Can I add something? There's also the fact that this 10% of radio loud AGN could be just a, a duty cycle. No? We still don't know if every AGN uh, pass through this radio phase, so that's not. Yeah, th this was my question. Maybe this is a possibility, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next is Filippo. Filippo Manucci, please ask it. I have a question on the first part of Paolino's talk. Um, the central velocity dispersion is a complex uh, quantity. It depends on uh, the presence of AGN, of course, on a black hole, depends mainly on the mass of the galaxy, which is proportional to the mass, but also depends on uh, the dimension of the galaxy. So uh, I'm puzzled about uh, um, relating, uh, uh, translating the dependence of the central velocity, of the uh, feedback efficiency on the central velocity dispersion uh, directly to towards the effect of an AGN of the black hole uh, as uh, maybe too simplistic. Can you comment on this? Yeah, so uh, the, that's the beauty of having uh, 
galaxies with so much resolved information because uh, uh, you can, uh, um, well, keep in mind that this is the most expression of the stars, okay? It's not the gas, okay? So it's not that this is star uh, gas which is uh, uh, steered by uh, any other uh, mechanism. So it's uh, simply the same, the most expression of the stars and is uh, what is, uh, if I may share again, is what is uh, most uh, uh, tightly correlated with the, with the black hole mass. So you may, so this is for instance, one of the several examples, I think if Francesco Shankaro is here, unfortunately he told me that he couldn't attend, but he would uh, complete, provide for the information, but the, the, the quantity which correlates most directly with the direct measurements of black holes is the velocity dispersion, the central velocity dispersion, rather than uh, stellar mass uh, and, and uh, other quantities. So this is a sort of, and we're talking about velocity dispersion of stars, okay? But having said that, uh, then you can say, see, uh, you could still have some um, residual the, the relation with uh, large mass and so on. But this is exactly what we have done here, that you take all the possible quantities, including, say, say surface density of the bulge mass, surface density of the population, radius, as you just said, and you can disentangle of this quantity because you have everything. The statistics is so large. You, of course, you can do this kind of study only when you have uh, statistics of zillions of galaxies as trillions of uh, regions, okay? And you do see that you can differentiate between these individual dependencies and uh, uh, identifying a hierarchy in their uh, role in quenching. And so you see, as you said, the radius, it doesn't count anything. The stellar surface density counts very little. A stellar mass of the galaxy or the bulge counts even uh, the same less. So you do, you can actually um, differentiate uh, these, uh, these effects. Could you please, uh, so Stefano Di Betti, are you happy with this answer or would you like to, I haven't seen your, your question before, it was in a separate box, so please put your question on the chat so I can see it more quick, more easily. So Stefano, would you would you like to add something? No. Okay, so let's move to Raffaella's question. Yes, so thank you very much for these beautiful talks. I, um, I have maybe a provocative question. So you both emphasize that uh, the black hole needs to grow before it, it actually affects uh, the galaxy through feedback. However, uh, simulations have shown clearly that uh, star formation is able to regulate black hole growth. So in a sense, um, this is a, I mean, what you are proposing is actually a change of uh, perspective or paradigm because from my point of view, uh, which, you know, the studying of black hole growth seems to suggest that indeed it's star formation which regulates black hole growth. So overall, again, you know, before the black hole grows to the point that really um, can affect its host galaxy, it is star formation which regulates uh, uh, its own growth. So I don't know if you have any comment on that. And I have a, a little, um, a, uh, you know, point that I would like to uh, to ask uh, related to the bright and luminous quasars that Roberto was mentioning. Um, so uh, in those particular cases, uh, you you actually expect strong environmental um, properties. I mean, you you are rich, you are actually. Uh, um, uh, looking at very biased regions where where you know you might expect mergers to be to be very important so in a sense we know that mergers also affect star formation so i i think that one thing that is very difficult to disentangle is actually at, in these particular environments um the uh, star formation induced by black hole or rather uh, you know occurring almost at the same time as black hole growth is, is uh, might, might be it might be in place due to you know strong activity and environmental dependence I don't know maybe Michaela wants to comment on that she has a better view on that from from simulations um, yeah so maybe I should start with a with the first part um, where you were like referring to um, 
star formation feedback regulated black hole growths. And so I think from the simulation point of view, this is indeed correct. Also, I am always wondering whether it's really giving us the right answer because you also have to adopt something how stellar feedback works and maybe in dwarf galaxies or some, I don't know, maybe it's working differently and maybe, you know, you still can have some black hole accretion events which are, which are then allowing for some feedback because I think that that's what I've been mentioning in my talk with like that there is a discrepancy or tension between simulations and observations because there are observations showing an increasingly large fraction of AGN in dwarfs and you can even find isolated quiescent dwarfs with AGN activity what suggested observers to think that it could be induced by the central AGN and I think it's very interesting to maybe explore better how the stellar and HGN feedback is actually really, you know, affecting each other or, or working together. Okay. And um, so for, for the second part, so um, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, fully understand here what you meant. So could you maybe just briefly repeat? Oh, I was I was thinking that mergers uh, in these high density uh, regions where you you expect to see these bright and luminous quasars uh, might play a role even in setting somehow the duty cycle between uh, the star formation activity and the black hole luminous phase. So it, observationally it might be very difficult to disentangle whether the star formation is actually induced by the black hole activity as Roberto was uh, you know kind of you know suggesting when he was reviewing some of the observations yeah so I think um, I, I I don't know any simulations where cosmological ones where you're seeing this type of positive feedback also like particular like after a merger where you have like heavy heavy um, um, phases of, of black hole accretion and feedback. But I also know about studies, I think of isolated galaxies where they did indeed find this mechanism of positive feedback. But I think from a cosmological point of view, because you're not really having the resolution, it's again, very hard to model at the moment. But yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that's my impression. Uh, if I may add my, my perspective. <laughs> so, uh, a few things. One should also um, distinguish between uh, weather uh, that has things that happen on short time scales and doesn't have a long standing impact on a galaxy from uh, uh, integrated long, uh, long lasting uh, um, phenomena. So, the, the, uh, our finding on black hole mass is essentially telling you that the individual uh, injection of energy on, uh, sorry, uh, outflows that you may have and raining back uh, uh, of gas may uh, probably not have a strong effect, but uh, what is important is the, the, the black hole mass, which is the integrated AGN activity across all cosmic epochs that in the end results into a quenched galaxy. So, and these, uh, if you have an integrated effect, it's difficult to identify that with a single individual observation at a single epoch. So this is sort of a warning about what a single uh, is a snapshot given by an observation can tell us. The other thing is that uh, I fully agree that uh, with interlace uh, interaction between star formation and black hole and, and, and so on that Rafael was mentioning, and this actually may happen more likely at higher the shift, so it would be important, and this again will be probably be doable with uh, GWST, to redo this similar kind of analysis at higher edge shift, because what uh, I've shown is mostly local. As you go, as you have seen, as you go to higher edge shift, all, everything becomes more a bit more confusing. So this is, uh, will be important to address uh, with the uh, forthcoming observation with uh, GWST, Athena, and Alma already is doing, uh, is doing something. In terms of positive feedback, you know that I'm very fond of it because I think it's another aspect. I didn't touch on that because I was told to <laughs> focus on quenching. But uh, actually, the, the, um, there is uh, uh, an interesting uh, recent simulation by, I think, is the FIRE team. Um, 
when a lot, a lot of people are in there. Uh, and uh, they do predict that, for instance, there is the formation of stars in the uh, flowing gas. And this is in line with what, uh, for instance, uh, Stefano, uh, the, uh, what I've uh, shown from uh, uh, the, the AMA image from Stefano, where you have uh, outflowing clumps of gas which are self gravitating But interestingly, when you have this uh, positive feedback, what happens is that the supernovae that uh, are essentially, therefore, uh, happening uh, out of the galaxy uh, inject energy into the halo much more effectively than what they do in the ASM. Because in the ASM, you know, the, the problem with supernovae in, in feedback is that they uh, essentially, they, when they interact, the supernova uh, blast interact with the ASM, it soon, very quickly, lose the energy because of uh, uh, the relative losses. Instead, in the uh, single galactic medium, they, uh, they can expand freely and release essentially uh, couple all of the energy with the halo. And so this contributes further with the heating of the halo and actually in the end result in an additional uh, negative feedback or delayed feedback. That's uh, another interesting aspect that we didn't have time to discuss, but in the end, so I agree with you in the end. <laughs> so the comment from Raffaella was cool. Uh, <laughs> I would like to add something uh, uh, to the fact that uh, you mentioned, uh, Roberto, about the directionality of the jets, of the, the radio jets. Um, is that now there is increasing evidence of the fact that um, radio jets uh, are passing through phases and doing this, they change their direction. Yeah. So like LOFAR is discovering a lot of these new X-shaped radio galaxies. So uh, through this mechanism, maybe- you see also in this, uh, in this uh, again, uh, do you see the skin? You see also in the, in the bubble, so in the famous bubble, because uh, you see the previous, uh, previous uh, so the current bubbles are here, but in the, the X-ray map, you see that the previous event actually yeah. were offset. So it's not only propagation of sound waves, it's also the, uh, that the jet changed direction. They are absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sharing, I think, but anyhow, sorry. Okay, um, I have, I can see more questions um, booked. Um, so I think we are right on time of the 20 minutes of uh, question and answer time. So I really would like to thank the speakers. This was really very interesting uh, uh, fight, <laughs> if we call it, or match. Um, and uh, if you want to book the social dinner for tonight, uh, we will do it online. Joking, sorry. Uh, I leave it to the leave the to the organize, main organizer Paolo. Are you still there? Yes. Uh, thanks, Michaela, Roberto, and Francesca. So um, we reconvene tomorrow at 3 p.m. for the last, um, the fifth and last um, AGN uh, tourney with uh, Guido Risaliti chairing Marcella Brusa and Gabriele Ghisellini, and then a closing remark by Elisabetta Lusso. So thanks to everybody. And uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.